This talk is loosely based on the one I gave last year, which was called Megaliths, Shaman and City Builders, The Hidden Connections. And what I'm going to do this time is to give you, first of all, a brief summary of that talk, and then build on that to give you another alternative opinion on the truth about alchemy um, and the secrets of the, of the pharaohs, and including in that uh, something about shaman. And all of this is in, if I go too fast and you don't understand me, it's all in my book, so, and it's all for sale in the bookshop. And I'm going to gallop through this because there's a lot of material to cover. Uh, <clears throat> so what I want to concentrate on are the links between shaman and cities, because that is something that is not much talked about. Indeed, when we talk about shaman, what we mostly talk about are these sort of people. It's wild, it's elemental, it's powerful. Uh, we don't think about this sort of person, pharaohs. And yet they are linked, and it is these sophisticated shaman who we refer to as pharaohs, who are the connection with the cities, and yet still have much in common with their Mongolian and their Peruvian counterparts. It's just that we haven't realized, and one reason we haven't realized is because of these people, the Romans. These people, even more so than the Greeks, dominate us in so many ways through language, culture, mindset. We've inherited their way of thinking and their knowledge, and especially of civilized life. So many of us think that civilization starts with the Romans. But as well as being our means of accessing the past, because we can read their languages, um, the Greeks and the Romans, they also represent a barrier, because they did not fully understand these people, the Egyptians. The Greeks of all the Indo-Europeans had a much better understanding of the Egyptians, and it is mostly through the Greeks that we know as much as we do about the Egyptians, as the Greeks were the closest to them uh, from about 600 BC onwards. But after the end of the fourth century AD, even that possibility disappeared, and then so much about Egypt remained mysterious, a closed book. Even the Greeks, however, were denied access to all of Egypt's secrets. In particular, the Greeks only had a partial understanding of alchemy, which is why we have been in the dark about it, and we have not understood the connection with city builders for such a long time, and it's that that I'm going to tell you more about. Now, to answer that question, what I'm going to do is recap on where I was a bit last time, and go back to the beginning, because last time, what I was telling you about was a story that we have told ourselves about the arrival of civilization, and I said, it does not make sense. And part of the reason we have got the wrong story about the arrival of civilization, by which I mean living in cities, is because of our misunderstanding about alchemy. We are entirely ignorant of the connection between alchemy and the origin of cities, because what we have told ourselves is that cities arrived sometime around 5000 BC, as a result of a farming experiment. And this farming experiment is supposed to have started at the end of the Ice Age, some 10 to 12,000 years ago. But if we opened our minds to other possibilities, we would realize that this story that we tell ourselves, and you can read about it in the British Museum, does not make sense. And it's only by going so far back into history. And this is a map of the end of the, of the Ice Age. And we can see here that the dashed lines are um, the ice, the extent of the ice. This line is the lower sea level, because during the Ice Age it absorbed so much water that the, the sea levels um, were, were much um, lower. And the clans you, you can read about in, in my book. And this is where we tell ourselves that it all starts. So here you have the map of the Ice Age, and it's this bit here, around here, the Golden Crescent, that we tell ourselves this is where it all begins. And this is a mountainous region. I put up a little picture to give you a taste of what um, part of that mountainous region looks like. And it goes from mountains in Turkey, the tourist range, through these mountains here in Kurdistan and, and, and so on, and down through the Zagros Mountains in Iran. And um, what we say, what the British Museum says, is Paleolithic man, instead of sitting in his cave, started throwing seeds around outside, finds he has a um, surplus of crop, being clever, exchanges it for something else, and suddenly, hey presto, we as primitive people are on our way to becoming civilized with towns and cities growing out of early marketplaces. And these seeds that he throws around are the ones that magically become domesticated at around 9,500 BC. A people known as Natufians had been cultivating wild seeds for thousands of years before that without any change from wild to domestic. And when I say domestic seed, what I'm talking about 
is um, the, the, the difference of a single gene and one that doesn't relate to taste but relates to convenience. Convenience being one of the hallmarks of civilization. And here I put up typical barley head. And what we have here is um, these little seeds. And in between them are little hinges called arachis. And what happens in the wild seed is that when this is ripe, these seed heads, they just break. The, the arachis, the hinges break, and the seed, seeds scatter. Um, but what it does in the domesticated version is it waits to be picked. Now, when they have run computer models of this, uh, computer simulations, they've worked out that the chances of a rare genetic mutant wild seed turning into a domesticated one um, were calculated at two to four million seed heads for this change um, to occur naturally. In other words, it could take 20 to 30 cycles, i.e. even possibly 20 to 30 years if you only grow a crop once a year. Now, no one realistically is going to wait around that long uh, for the experiment to work. They'd return to trapping and say, Dad, you can forget your farming experiment. So the obvious conclusion to this is that this change was deliberate. Someone knew how to genetically interfere with, cere with, with cereals. And not only do we have um, domesticated cereals, we also have settlements, particularly the one that occurs here at Chattel Huig. Chattahoyak isn't exactly in the mountains, it's on a plain near Konya, but even so, it's still um, not that far from this mountainous area. And Chattahoyak is a one of a series of, of settlements going up in this direction. And by the way, the earliest seeds were found somewhere in the northern Euphrates area, somewhere around, around here. So what I'm saying is that activity is all happening in this, in this zone. <coughs> Here's a picture of um, Chattahuit reconstructed, and here's um, uh, the, the, the floor plans of, of all these settlements, um, of these buildings, to show you how well laid out it is. And what is even more significant about Chattahuit is that the central feature of these, um, this settlement are very well constructed storerooms, and these are better built than the human dwellings around them. And it is in places like Chattahuit that archaeologists, archaeologist Denise Chamant Besserat found all these tokens, 10,000 of them she's counted in different places, and they all represent something different. And it's an indicator that the bean counters, i.e. the accountants, were active, because these storerooms were very important. So people were busy taking stock of what they had. And it's important that we shouldn't forget where this, where this is taking place, because it's not only um, agriculture, but we have um, the earliest metalwork and we have the earliest pottery. Not civilization as such, no cities, but the fingerprints of civilizers. Because this is, in spite of this region being harsh and inhospitable, it's not an obvious place to grow crops. <clears throat> so it doesn't make sense. Now, I will return to this question of being in mountains a bit later. Then suddenly, Around 5000 BC, in what is referred to as the Early Bronze Age, the first cities start to appear, down here. Now this is as far away from up here as is possible to be. This is sea, by the way. We've got Mediterranean, Black Sea, this Persian Gulf here. This is um, modern day Iraq, for those that aren't familiar with Mesopotamia. Because here, at, a, at a, one of the cities called Eridu, there's evidence of 17 layers under a temple that dates from 2000 BC and possibly goes back as far as 5000 BC or before. It's an example of um, Uruk, one of those cities, an example of a highly organized uh, civilized city, planned layout, architecture, pictographic script, seals, cylinder seals. By 3600, the city of Uruk had um, 10,000 people living in it. And we know these are cities because they have recognizable infrastructure. They have um, evidence of activities like administration, record keeping, and so on. And it is around this time that something also happens in farming. It's what the archaeologists call the secondary products revolution. Now, the conventional story is, is it's because of this change that cities occur. And it's my proposition, it's the other way around. And what the secondary products revolution means is it's now we can take milk from a cow and make the secondary products of butter and cheese. Um, we can ride a horse, we can take wool from a sheep, we can plant a vine, the kind of farming that we recognize. 
But just how odd and how coincidental that when people start to live in cities, the production of food becomes more organised. And in my view, this shift had to be deliberate because no self-respecting hunter-gatherer would A, give up providing for himself until he could be sure of someone else doing the work for him, or B, would have a skill that would be useful in a city. And in particular, farming skills have to be taught. Farming is not natural. I suggest you try it if you think it is. It's much easier to kill stock if you're a hunter-gatherer than to keep it alive during the winter. So what this suggests to me is that these were not hunter-gatherers who changed because of some um, environmental difference, but they were actually different people with a different skill set. <clears throat> so here we go, 5000 BC. Um, the, because before, what happened before this is that they were, pinning, they were penning wild animals up for meat and hides. Now, if you're going to think that you can tame a wild animal penning it up just for meat and hides, that had been going on for thousands of years before this, and there was no change until these cities. This, believe it or not, this creature here, is a modern-day reconstructed, they've genetically reconstructed an ancient owl rock. And this is the precursor of, the, of the, our own domestic bulls. And, and the thing I want you to, to take away from this is how you make this sufficiently docile for his females that you can take milk, and, milk from to make butter and, and cheese. Um, and also, you couldn't um, use sheep before, before this date because sheep had, um, sheep had coats like deer, so it wasn't even possible to, to um, use sheep for, for wool. And the change to wool had a dramatic benefit, to, particularly for those that eventually went on to become the nomads of the Mongolian steppes where they could use it to make felt and a light and waterproof material for constructing yurts and so forth. The onager, now it had been thought that this was the precursor to the donkey. This, they had thought that this was the, the domestic equid of these people, the Mesopotamians, Sumerians. Uh, but Timothy Potts, writing in 1994 on behalf of the Oxford University Committee for Archaeology, he explains that um, investigations suggest they cannot be fully domesticated. So they were hunted for meat and hides and captured in order to be kept in a semi-wild state for crossbreeding with domestic equids. Which kind of begs the question, where do the domestic equids come from? Perhaps these were the tarpan. This is another reconstructed animal that they've taken genetics from and re gone, well, I don't know quite how they do it, but they kind of work them backwards. Um, and the tarpan, the early horse, is um, very relevant to this story. We will come back to the tarpan a bit later. Um, because the domestication of the horse was significant, uh, not just for farming, but it opened up possibilities of traction and transport, the need to invent, the need to invent the wheel. And I would argue that this change happened because of cities and not the other way around. Because the earliest evidence of a city's existence is not a marketplace, but a shrine. Priests. Priests were the first ones. And the earliest, as I said, the earliest one, I only do, it's not on this map, but it's there. Um, it has uh, 17 layers of temples under the one that was discovered in 2000, that dates to 2000 BC. Um, someone like Jaquetta Hawkes, a writer on this subject, she commented on the fact that the key people who were involved in cities from the start are not farmers, but the priests. And they may have looked something like this. Were these the founders of civilization? Were, this, was this, were these examples of an elite, an advanced people with no known origin, a people who had access to sophisticated knowledge, scientific and otherwise, who could deliberately introduce certain changes we now take for granted? Because cities did not evolve, they were not organic things, they were pre-planned artificial constructs on the landscape. And, um, and I argue that the reason why they knew about this is because they knew about an archetype of civilization that I refer to as the Ur concept of civilization. The Egyptians called it living in Mart, living in truth, the goddess Mart having the feather of truth, but I prefer Ur. Because in this context, it doesn't just mean the famous city that Sir Leonard Woolley excavated in the 1920s in southern Iraq, here we see, Ur. Uh, it has the meaning of, because um, he, he, we refer to this as Ur uh, of the Chaldees, but actually I think Ur uh, of the Chaldees was somewhere else. I think Ur uh, of the Chaldees was actually up here, um, south of Haran. Um, I think we've got very confused in our, in our biblical stuff, because the point about this word Ur uh, is it means foundation. You can see it in the name Jerusalem, as in Urushalem, foundation of peace. 
And in my view, the best way to describe this ER concept is with the help of a color wheel. Because what I'm saying is that civilization arrives as a package. It's a total blueprint. It's not evolving out of just this bit. It's not just farm animals and it's not just cereals. It's the whole thing all together of a piece. And it's based on all the usual attributes of city living, straightness, accuracy, precision, organization, infrastructure, so forth, not random. And it's the, the priesthood that is the most important part. It holds everything together. They were the early motivational force. They supervised the construction of the great infrastructure works, the temples, the, the canals, um, all, all these huge um, monumental architecture that we see. They sanctioned trading exchanges. Um, they determined the calendar and helped um, farmers predict the weather. Um, they educated um, the young. Um, and they helped the keep rec written records and they helped the uh, heal the sick and um, send the dying on their way. They understood the soul, um, the psyche, and its role in reincarnation and I immortality. And there are also relationships across this, this thing. So you have all forms of communication. So trade, travel, education. You have um, the link between the individual body and um, cared for through art of cooking. And by cooking, I mean cuisine. I mean not just nuts and berries from the hedger, I mean taking on spices. I mean um, cooking as we'd understand it in terms of French cuisine or whatever. And also organized cooking in terms of bakeries and breweries and that kind of thing. And so the link between food and medicine, um, Asclepius, a much later Greek god, very much understood this link between uh, food and medicine. Um, agriculture, as I said before, is very much the organized, systematic organization of domestication of animals and ar arable. And when I'm talking about arable, I'm talking about ditching and irrigation and very much organized, not just clearing little... I don't know if any of you watched the Kogi film last night, but yesterday um, afternoon, but, and it'll be on again today, where you're clearing bits. I'm talking about something that's much more systematic and on a bigger scale. And the one that's of most interest to us today the power one, which is not just political power, administration, justice, architecture, infrastructure, but religious power, the defined roles of the priesthood and the really important relationship between priest and king, the shamanic part. Um, and this is an archetype which exists in, for all time and it's available in, in many different places, which is why the same characteristics appear um, in all these, I don't know how many of you can see this, this is the sort of the Near East ones. This is um, the earliest ones in Mesopotamia. Um, and then you have Egypt after that and the Phoenicians, uh, the Minnow and Cre Cretans and the Indus Valley. And not on this map is Central and Southern America and possibly uh, Far East, China and maybe even um, Bosnia, who, who, who knows. Um, but what is truly extraordinary about this uh, concept is, um, is the confirmation of it. Now this is something that I don't think anybody else has picked up, is a confirmation of its existence. Among a people who themselves were not civilized and who can be found living a long way away from cities. Um, they didn't live in cities. And the people I'm talking about are probably our ancestors. I'm talking about Indo-Europeans. And these are the very early Indo-European tribes long before they came to Europe. And when I'm talking about Indo-Europeans, I'm talking about people who spoke these languages. So I'm talking about Celts, I'm talking about Germans, Greeks, um, Indians and Iranians, Romans, uh, and all of these. I'm not talking about Hungarians, and I'm not talking about Basques. Uh, and the fact that, that Hungarian is, uh, although they were physically close to these tribes, they didn't speak their languages, is a way of proving that these links between these Indo-European tribes is more than coincidence. And how this connection was discovered was in the 19th century when people looked at Indian Sanskrit and they realized that although it was written in a different alphabet, the language had the same roots as these other languages. And so they came to the decision, the conclusion that these people must have lived together once. And the date I'm talking about is before the end of the fourth millennium BC. So as early as 5,000 years ago, these people lived together. Because otherwise, if that isn't the case, then for the Celts and the Indians to have had the same words 
would have meant the Celts riding thousands of miles to tell the Indians that the word for X was now Y, which is kind of just absurd. That's so not, not going to happen. And where I think these people came from is the Ukraine. It's not India, and it's not Europe, it's the Ukraine. And um, it's not only myself who, who's worked, I worked this out through sort of various routes, through looking at language and so forth, but some, a geneticist like Dr. Spencer Wells, who published in 2004, and he's responsible for the National Geographic Genographic Project. And um, he's established that um, 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 genetic material taken from um, Indo-Europeans in India uh, originates up here in the Ukraine. But the looking at language is completely fascinating because language etymology, it reveals what kind of environment we knew, what kind of dwellings we had, what skills we had, and to a limited extent what we thought. And even more remarkable, and this is definitely something I haven't seen anywhere else, is that analysis of the language and other factors shows that these early Indo-Europeans came into contact with the civilizers. I mean, nobody, for some reason, nobody has worked out that that is must be the case, and I'll explain why it must be the case. Because in my opinion, certain concepts that re relate to that Ur civilization archetype have been embedded in our language for more than 5,000 years, two and a half thousand years before we lived in cities. Now contact, I'm only going to run through a very few examples of this contact. Contact with these civilizers is implied that we Indo-Europeans knew something about metallurgy, and we knew about bronze and copper, but we didn't know about tin. Now, the significance of this is that if you know about bronze, you will know that you need copper and tin to make it because it's an alloy. There are other alloys of bronze. I'm not suggesting tin is the only one. And the point about that is that copper and tin are in geographically hugely distant areas. They're, they're not in places that are next to each other. So it's not even as if you can experiment and suddenly produce bronze. You need to know about it. That's the point. And what this suggests, the fact that the Indo-Europeans did not know about tin, means that they had, were given bronze. They knew how to use it. They got it from somewhere else. And we also picked up from the civilizers knowledge about farming skills. Um, we knew about um, stop key. We had all these words in our, in our language. These can all be traced back to common roots over 5,000 years. Um, to do with uh, sowing, grinding, yokes, field, plows, all the rest of that. Uh, stop breeding, herding. In fact, I think I'm going to lose one here. Uh, <clears throat> right down the bottom, secondary products. We also knew about making butter and cheese. So we, we had been given from the civilizers the knowledge of the things that relate to that Ur concept. And is this just a coincidence? The fact that the Sumerian word, the Mesopotamian word, the civilizers word for copper was Urud, and the Indo-European word is rood. I mean, extraordinary. It's where we get our color, our um, word red from. Now, there's a very good reason why these civilizers would want to make contact with the early Indo-Europeans, because there was certain something that the Indo-Europeans had for which the civilizers were keen to exchange ideas and concepts and skills. And it is, in my view, this certain something that places the proto-Indo-Europeans in distinctive time and place. And that certain something was the wild horse. And it reconstructs to this word equos, from which we obviously get equine and all the rest of it. Again, over 5,000 years old. Because what it is, is that the Indo-Europeans, they lived in the range of the tarpan. So that's why they were of interest, because the, the civilizers obviously went looking for where these animals existed in the wild in order to domesticate them. And so with them be, knowing how to genetically interfere with wild creatures, and when I'm talking about genetic interference, I'm saying, I don't personally think it is possible just by penning something up to, to breed it as something that becomes docile. I have horses myself and I have kept cattle and bulls and all sorts and I have great respect for all these animals. I have animals on the farm that could easily kill you. Uh, and I know that something has changed in their heads. Um, um, our Prehistorian archaeologists, people who write about this stuff, also talk about the domesticated variants changing in shape, becoming smaller and so forth. But to me, what matters is the fact they change in their heads. They become handleable. Human beings can work with them. Now, what you have to bear in mind about this is that this tarpan had been living up here 
for thousands of years with the Indo-Europeans, but had been no use to them, just meat and hides. And why we, why we know this is because um, dating from 4000 BC, there's a site here at Sredni Stog region called Derevka, uh, where the earliest um, horse bones have been found. I mean, there is a slight confusion about this because they talk about the teeth being worn um, but, and this proving it was rideable, but actually horses don't wear bits on their teeth, so, but it probably was a domesticated horse. And the breakthrough in the exploitation of the deep steppe, which is going over this way, this is the Volga River, so this is sort of Russia, this is Ukraine now, this is going over towards the steppe, this is the Caspian Sea here. Um, the breakthrough doesn't come till 3500 BC, and then you see the first wheeled carts appearing on the, these northern steppes. And, and use of the horse spreads west, it comes down through the Balkans, here's the Balkans down here. But the civilizers would also have brought horses down to the Ukraine, probably down through the Caucasus. <clears throat> and they didn't make an immediate impact. There's not immediate evidence, but from about 2800 BC onwards, 80% of the people living down here lived in cities and had wheeled carts. Now, from the Proto-Indo-Europeans' point of view, this shift to domestic horses had such an impact on them that they venerated the horse for thousands of years. They attributed godlike powers to them. Um, their general attitude towards religion was very simple. It was very nature-based, sky god, earth mother. Their idea of religion was, was simple. Creed mean, is a reconstructed word. Two words, kr and de, means put into your heart. And the civilizers not only left this legacy of domestication and animals and metallurgy, but certain concepts such as this one to do with king, now, where you see an asterisk in front of a word, it means it's a reconstructed Proto-Indo-European word, so it means it's over 5,000 years old. And you can see in these languages, it comes out as Rex, Rix, Raj, Reich, um, all these words for king. And this has completely confused um, ling linguists um, because it's a remarkable concept as it underpins the whole idea of regulation, accuracy, word... We have it in English with the word ruler um, to do with the king who's ruling and a measuring stick. We, we preserve that, that um, combination of the two. But the linguists know what kind of environment these early Indo-Europeans lived in and they know that they, they were wild and warlike. They didn't have rules and regulations and they certainly didn't live in cities because they actually lived in things like this. At the most, they lived in fortified settlements. Um, so this explanation to me is only understandable because the Indo-Europeans picked up this concept from people for whom it did have meaning, um, i.e. the civilized people. And then in, in, at the end of the fourth millennium BC, there is an appalling environmental catastrophe which results in a massive migration of peoples. Um, so you have um, Celts going furthest west off to um, Ireland and going furthest east to um, becoming Tokarians, they end up in China. This is a little, little picture of a Tokarian baby. And don't laugh, but 4,000 year old, six foot tall, ginger haired mummies wearing tartan have been found in the Chinese Taklamakan Desert. Um, and those who become Indians come down through here and end up in, in the Indus Valley. Um, where, <clears throat> where they meet up again with the civilizers. Now, the key difference between the, the civilizers, they leave Ur, and they, the key difference between them and the Indo-Europeans is that the civilizers go by sea, and they go off, uh, eventually ending up in here and here. These are the Indus Valley cities. They also come round the bottom here, and they become Egyptians and enter through the Eastern Desert, uh, they become Phoenicians, they go off to Minoan Crete. Um, and so these people arrive in their new homelands a lot earlier than these people. These people take quite a long time, like several thousand years, to get to their, to their new homelands. And it's one of the key differences between them. Now, Celts are really interesting of all of those that, that went um, the furthest, because just to make this point really um, furthest east, and furthest west. I mean, Ireland is some way, way over here. And what you have to bear in mind in terms of genetics or ling ling linguistics is that the things that are on the edge become what they call, they retain archaism. So they develop more slowly than things in the middle. 
Anyway, so one of the really interesting things about um, the Celts is they possibly retained the knowledge of the gods of the civilizers because they continued to refer to this god, who's an Egyptian god, um, Thoth, as Tetartes. And Tetartes is one of his original early names when the Greeks and the Romans had already changed him to Hermes or Mercury, <coughs> which suggests that it's possible that the Celts may have known him before the start of Egypt, which is kind of a slightly strange thought. And the name Hermes itself is worth noting, as at its root is the word Ur, Mez. This word Ur, the foundation, as I was saying to you, this concept of civilization. And what Ur, Mez means in this context is Mez means son of, as in Tut Moses, one of the pharaohs means son of Thoth, son of Tut. And so this could mean, were the, were the Greeks referring to him as the son of the foundation? Did they see Thoth as the son of the foundation? Um, but although the, the Indo-Europeans knew certain things about civilizers, one of the things they did not know about is they did not know about their shamanic ritual. And they did not know all the metaphysical secrets of the original archetype, which is why they possibly never built cities themselves. There are no cities in the Ukraine that date back to that time. And they also didn't know about other aspects of Thoth. In particular, they didn't know about his relationship. I don't know if any of you can, many of you can see this. It says Jehuti, that's another of his names. And it's to do with the being the original originator of sound or vibration. And this is an idea that vibration sets all matter into, into motion in primeval time. Because the name Jehuti links to the Jed pillar and the symbol of... Um, these, these are jed, this is a Jed pillar here. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little Jed pillar here. This is another Jed pillar. Which is the divine sound which sets everything into motion. Cosmic vibration, in other words, animating all matter, bringing it to life derived from a cosmic ambience which exists at inception. Now, someone called Rosemary Clark describes the principle of the Jed as being a high science practiced in temples with a chant accompanied by sacred instruments, drum and system. Knowledge of these frequencies enabled the temple mages to invite sacred forces into the sanctuary. A Jed was a fundamental resonance in whatever form that affects ma living matter, music, chanting, or even speech. So in the same way as we have in the, in the Bible, the idea that the word, the importance of the word at the beginning, the Egyptians had the same concept of the word being very important in the creation of the world. The first discourse of the Hermetica speaks of the chaotic dark waters of potentiality on which Artem's word fell, calming them and making them pregnant with all forms. So there's an idea of things coming out. And this, uh, this concept of cosmic um, vibration carries on into a science called cymatics. And cymatics is about um, knowing that certain sounds produce certain shapes that you find in nature, such as starfish, snowflakes, zebra stripes, honeycomb. And furthermore, is it possible that the ancients, knowing about these vibrations and frequencies, did they therefore have some kind of connection with that and quantum physics? Is this what was meant by magic in the ancient past? Because there's certainly the point about um, quantum physics is it is certainly strange and magical. There is no doubt about that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, for a start, you have uh, nature is as observed. The observer has a role in, in the observing of it. Um, we have principles of non-locality, particles being in, can be in two places at once. Um, and we have Heisenberg's um, uncertainty principle because it's not possible to know whether um, a particle is a particle or it's a wave. So the two things can be either um, completely, um, it's all to do with probability. Is Schrodinger's cat alive or dead? Nobody knows. It's a, just a probability of whether it's one or the other. Um, and what physicists have now begun to discuss is this interchangeability between matter and energy. And if you think that's a mistake, it's not. I've written it deliberately. Because what I want to, the point I want to make is the fact that energy and matter are interchangeable. And what people have begun to realize that even at a subatomic sub level, something which gives the appearance of solidity isn't necessarily solid, isn't solid, because it's full of electrical um, stuff. 
and you have zero point frequencies where all these things happen. <clears throat> and in Egypt, they had this concept of the um, Hekar priest who was um, able to manipulate certain forces. Um, we would call him a magician. What he's holding in his hands are actually two snakes. These are two, and again, this word Ur comes into it. Now, I need to tell you what, how they actually knew all these things, how they knew how to manipulate stuff, because what I'm saying is that the evidence of their ability to manipulate is the fact they could move um, 50 tons of granite 500 miles from Aswan without the use of slaves and um, copper tools and hemp rope, which I don't think was the answer to how they actually moved stuff. They knew things. So to go back to this concept of the shaman, a shaman is someone who knows how to take himself, have an out-of-body experience, and in out of his astral planning. And when he's out of body, he can go and ask the answers for, to, for answers to things. And what these guys mostly do these days is they ask answers for a sick child or um, a person. And, and the key thing to remember about this is that these are people who are trained from a very, very early age. Again, that Coggy film, if you watch it again today, will explain to you what something or what a shaman does. They are initiated from the beginning um, to, to, to take on this role of, of being able to split themselves out and travel in an astral form. And so um, I'm saying that this is what also happened to, to um, shaman, to pharaohs. <clears throat> because what I'm going to talk about now is this very important relationship. Now, this name Melchizedek actually relates to these two words, priest, king, because Melch has the idea of king, and Zadok is, is priest. And this, this is the key part of um, this. And uh, in the ancient concept of, of civilization, it was the king who went on this journey, who went on this astral planning while still alive. And the actual name Pharaoh could be an interesting... Sorry, probably lost me in there. Um, interesting corruption, uh, Greek corruption, the words per u. The Greeks corrupted this name, per u. Again, this word u comes. Because the new meaning of per u is house of foundation. House of foundation, which could have been this place at Neken or Heranacopolis. This is the remains of a mysterious fort. Um, and um, and what, the, what the pharaoh prepared for here in his house of foundation was a very important festival which only happened every 40 years, something called the Heb Sed Festival. Antoine did, did actually mention it yesterday. And during the Heb Sed Festival, he participated in the Osirian rites, the reenactment of the death of the god Osiris and the revival of his hands, um, Isis. This is a typical place where the Heb Sed Festival took part. This is the Heb Sed Festival court. This is the great um, pyramid at Saqqara. So they're always built next to a pyramid. They built pyramids specifically for, for these purposes, in my view. Citizens came from all over Egypt for this reenactment of um, dedication of uh, the whole thing to, to civilization. And there were public aspects where he ran around this court in wearing a special bull kilt, and there were also secret aspects. And he participated in a ritual meal called the hetep, um, in which he consumed something called the solar bread. This is the solar bread being offered here. And, um, and it was after consuming this meal that the pharaoh disappeared into the secret part of the festival, which took place inside a pyramid, where he entered the realm of the deity, Sokar. Here is Sokar. And the point about Sokar is that he represents more than just being dead. You have to remember, the pharaoh is alive during all of this. And Sokar was a triple manifestation of the gods Tar, Sokar, and Osiris. Triple powers of animation, incarnation, and restoration, essential to an Egyptian ideas of cycles of life and death. So it's about the soul being immortal and reincarnated. Sokar represented the latent spiritual principle within all living things, spirit embedded in the deepest regions of matter that await arisal, rather than, so it's not to do with being dead. Also, you have to remember what the net word for pyramid in Egyptian was. It's this word mur, M-R, which has the idea of an instrument for ascending. And if you look at how the Great Pyramid itself is constructed, I mean, we all know it's massive. It's 13 acres. It's 2.3 million blocks. Some of them are 50 tons each. It's perfectly aligned. Four corners are true 90-degree an angles to within a hundredth of an inch. Um, but what's remarkable is what happens inside it. 
It's very deliberately constructed, but it has no internal ornamentation. It's unlike any of the burial places at, um, at the Mastabas at Saqqara or wherever, which have beautiful life scenes. There's nothing inside um, the, the, the Great Pyramid. And the most important of it all is the, is the king's chamber, this, this one here. Uh, the chamber is actually down here, and it's above it. It has all these um, slabs with gouges taken out. And the other thing to notice is that the ceiling, you can't see it so well from this, is actually not tied into the walls. The walls freestand in the, in the king's chamber. And in my view, the whole point about that, use, the use of granite, which, is, which was deliberately taken uh, 500 miles from Aswan, from the quarry there, the 50-ton slabs, is that granite vibrates. It has its piezoelectrical properties. The walls aren't tied in, and there are chunks taken out of these slabs, which you can't see, so it's not for decoration, um, in order to create resonance, in order to fine-tune them. And the other thing that makes me suspicious is that in the king's chamber, there's a granite sarcophagus. Now, part of the Hebsed festival is the pharaoh lay down either in a sarcophagus or on a gold leaf bed. This is an example of a gold leaf bed. And you can see the gold leaf bed of King Tut in um, the Cairo Museum. Gold being a good conductor of electricity. And before doing that, the pharaoh put on the Kenny garment, which is this thing, over his chest. And he participated in the Wapuet opening of the mouth ceremony, which is this metal thing. And now was the point of the Kenny garment to protect his heart, because he was about to enter an electrical field in, while in trance. And was the purpose of the Wapuet to stop him swallowing his tongue um, during this trance? And what confirms my suspicions this is a very poor photograph, but what confirms my suspicions are these pyramid texts, which are written on the walls of the pyramid um, at Saqqara. Someone like Dr. Jeremy Nader, an Oxford academic, is one of the few who has realized that these are shamanic texts. Because what, in the 19th century, when Flinders Petrie was um, discovering all this, and it talks about the journey of the pharaoh's soul, he assumed the pharaoh was dead. Because when we in the West talk about the soul, we assume people are dead. But actually, it's more likely he was alive. And because these texts talk about the pharaoh um, flying up like a bird, climbing a ladder, um, these are shamanic terms which you find among shamans all over the world. Uh, chapter 20 of the Book of the Dead uh, talks the pharaoh uh, rising into the sky like a mighty hawk. And the point is, is what he is going to find is he's going to the imperishable northern stars, the Kemi. Now, this is a really important part about the whole clue of what I'm, what I'm dis describing here. So if this was a shamanic, and I'll come back to this, if this was a shamanic experience, was the hetep meal the means by which he brought on this chance? The significant element of the meal was the solar bread. Um, it's described in the pyramid text as an uh, enigmatic food spell um, offering to fly up. Essential ingredient, um, this is when the story gets really interesting, because the Greeks confuse a process with an outcome, and this process is what we call alchemy. <clears throat> and the links are to do with the cow goddess Hathor. Yesterday you heard some other stuff about Hathor, but I'm going to talk about this aspect of her. It's to do with nurturing, we know about that, uh, Antoine covered that, but also another of her names was Nubt, N-U-B-T. Um, here we have it here. And this is um, a word that has to do with gold. And you can find on the back of her temple at Dendra the, the hieroglyph for gold. And what we know about alchemy is it's to do with gold. Um, Muni Sadhu, writing in the 1950s, talks about the philosopher's stone being the goal, goal of alchemy, and that there's a universal solvent called the magnesium sages, and that stone is a powder. And he identifies that as having an electrical charge, so there's powder. Um, there's electrical charge connected with it and a dazzling white color and also has levitational properties, this, this monatomic gold. Um, so have we been misled? Is alchemy perhaps not the changing of um, base metals into gold but the purification of gold? I put up this image because this is a 4,000 year old um, thing. You can see it in the British Museum and it's a very, very pure gold and they use, could use electricity to, to create this, this powder. So maybe what we haven't realized is that the philosopher's stone and the solar bread are the same thing. The Egyptians used the levitational properties of white powder as their means of entering their trance. And the temples of Hathor played a major part in all of that. Because in this one in, at Dendra, there are these strange light bulb reliefs in the crypt down below. And remember, we, I referred to electricity as being part of the process. And even more significantly, at this temple in the Sinai Peninsula, there's another temple of, of Hathor, um, Flinders Petrie found a mysterious white powder which had no animal residue in, in it. It was found under the, in slabs under the floor. 
So was the pharaoh astral planing to the normal, northern stars? Is this the true meaning of alchemy? Because the normal meaning for alchemy is it's to do with chem being the black lands. But in my view, it's to do with the chemi. It's to do with the, 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 fixed, um, the fixed stars. This makes far more sense to me. So what was the pharaoh communicating with? So he was astral planing when he was doing this. What was he communicating with? This, this is part of what he was doing. He was trying to reconnect his car. Um, Antoine mentioned the car yesterday. And <clears throat> with his bar, this is what he was doing in this process in order to communicate and become a heron or a phoenix. Now, what's interesting about that is this word phoenix, which is a Greek word, has to do with burning. <clears throat> and the phoenix arises out of the ashes. And the Greek word for, for this is pyramid, which also has to do with fire. But remember, for the, for the Egyptians, it's to do with um, instrument for ascending. It's mer, it's M-R. So this is, the, this is the Egyptian word for pyramid. Um, the mer, car, is the important bit. The bar, and this is the one that's going to blow your minds away. Is this the link? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you had the same reaction as I did when I saw that. I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist it. Um, but anyway, is there a link between um, what the, 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 the um, pharaoh was communicating with and an Egyptian word for nitr or natures? Um, and an in Indo-European, is another connection with the Indo-Europeans. Because um, nitr, interestingly enough, in Indo-European comes a snake. Um, which um, translates or, or follows through as natrix in Latin, uh, nether in Old Irish, and nether, we drop the N eventually, and it becomes adder in, in English. Now, research which is relevant here is the work of um, Jeremy Narby, his Cosmic Serpent book, because you can see here snakes and DNA and, and all the rest of it. He traveled to the Peruvian Amazon in 1985 as part of his PhD research, and there he undertook shamanic experiences using the ayahuasca vine. And during this process, he, he engaged of the pair of enormous snakes and what struck him was the visual parallel between the image of the entwined snakes such as in the caduceus and that of the double helix and is that perhaps the reason why um, Thoth then has this um, caduceus, the double snakes and what he discovered was how people knew about their knowledge of medicinal plants which were highly toxic these plants, no possibility of experimentation because they would kill you but out of 80,000 Amazonian plants he could find exactly, they could find exactly the ones and they were t he was told it was through shamanic stuff because what he, the conclusion he came to was that this parallel was more than visual, it was actual. He decided that shamans were communicating at the level of molecular DNA, of DNA itself. Uh, because he was very struck by, the, by the, the discussion of the double helix of the DNA described as a ladder, a spiral staircase, which compares the shamanic terms to do with um, climbing ladders um, while, in, while in trance. Um, so we go back to the mountains, and this is obviously why uh, mountains were so important to the early civilizers, because that's where the gold is, even though we don't know where the earliest cities were. And the point about Chateau Huyk and being so well constructed, the storerooms being better built than the human dwellings, is because Chateau Huyk was part of a supply emporia for those who were carrying out work, and obsidian is particularly found here. Uh, there's all sorts of um, um, bronze and copper, um, Copper is found uh, up here, um, and, um, and Mesopotamia had no gold reserves, and yet its um, ancient name is Key-NG. This is the name the Mesopotamians um, themselves call it, and what this translates as is land where gold is king. Uh, so Mesopotamian gold clearly came from the aptly named Golden Crescent. And what made the hair stand on the back of my neck was when I realized that the earliest sites of pottery, such as this at Hamadan, are also on sites of, of gold roots. And there are all sorts of links, toponyms, gold mines, all sorts, all during this, this area. Ideas about where the earliest Garden of Eden was, all, all of that through there. So it now should be clear that the links between alchemy, cities, and shaman, wise men who can take their souls on journeys for the benefit of others, at great personal risk to themselves, because you can die during this, literally, are integral to each other. And the reason we haven't realized is because of the barrier of the Greeks and Romans, uh, which got worse after the fourth century AD when the monotheistic religion we call Christianity. And I would say at that point, civilization collapsed. And we have been living in the dark ages ever since, struggling to reconnect with the original archetype that appeared 5,000 years ago. The timeline of the decline of Egypt, 
I think starts here with the shift from Bronze Age to Iron Age. Fall of Troy to me symbolizes that. Um, Egypt was then invaded by the Persians, then the Indo-European tribe, who were the first to invade Egypt in about 600 BC. At this point, the Egyptians realized things are not looking good. That's when they start to talk to the Greeks. And that's why all of a sudden, the Greeks know everything. They know all about mathematics, medicine, the whole lot. Um, and in 333 BC, Alexander, he so loves Egypt, he wants to invade it as a, a very different from the normal conqueror. He actually wants to invade it because he loves it. Um, but the Romans, who were desperate um, to, to get hold of Egypt, did not succeed until 30 BC with Antony and Peer, um, Cleopatra. And then um, when the last um, Roman Romano Christians killed off the last Egyptian priest in 394 AD, quite a long time later, in this temple of Isis, which is on the island of Philo, which actually has been moved. This is in the um, Upper Nile. <clears throat> These, these Romano-Christian priests, uh, monks who killed these priests, were the same people who destroyed the site of Eleusian Mysteries in Greece in 3960 AD, burnt down the, and burnt down the famous library of Alexandria in 415 AD. So long before the fourth century AD, life had become difficult for Egypt. Um, yeah, five minutes. <laughs> uh, I have nearly finished. Um, and it's after 394 AD, all knowledge of hieroglyphs was only rediscovered 1,500 years later in the 19th century with the translation of the Rosetta Stone by the Frenchman Champollion. So access to Egyptian wisdom and knowledge became really difficult. It disappeared, soon forgotten. So by the end of the 4th century AD, the Romano Christians had symbolically and literally cut off from the um, ancient past. So not really surprising, we fell into the Dark Ages, that we knew nothing about shamanic ritual or pharaohs or connections between alchemy and cities. And not only the secret knowledge of all of that was lost, but also knowledge of reincarnation, as is depicted in this Egyptian Hall of Judgment. Um, because what you had was the soul, after it had confessed in front of all these negative professions, in front of all these deities, it was weighed against the feather of truth. That's the, the, the heart soul. And if you were found to have um, spoken the truth and lived a good life and not polluted the Nile or committed adultery, then Osiris, who's sitting in judgment with you, he allowed you to go through to join the ancestors. But if you, if you were found to have not lived a good life, then this chap, Apopis or Apopet, the devourer of souls, consumed you. And your punishment was not hell in that case, although probably is hell in some other ways. It was to be reincarnated. It was to come back to this world. And now, the, the fascinating thing is when you compare this iconography with the iconography of the early Christian church, if you go to look at medieval doom paintings, you'll see the same weighing scales. You'll see St. Peter with his cross um, keys in judgment. But in that case, you go to heaven or hell. They didn't, the church did not want you to know that you had a second chance, that you had a chance to be reincarnated. So they deliberately airbrushed this chap out of the whole thing. And I think that that's particularly awful. Anyway, there is a, the Romans, the Egyptians knew that the writing was on the wall. There's a particularly sad um, prophecy in the Hermetica. Truth were told, our land, temple, the whole world. Time will come and Egypt will be abandoned. The land that was the seat of reverence will be widowed by the powers and left destitute of their presence. Where foreigners occupy the land and territory, not only will reverence fall into neglect, but a prohibition will be enacted against reverence, fidelity, and divine worship. And then this most holy land, seat of shrines and temples, will be filled complete with tombs and corpses. Only your stories will survive, and they will be incredible to your children. Only words cut in stone will survive to tell your faithful works. Whoever survives will be recognized as an Egyptian. Only by his language and his actions he will seem a foreigner. So it's not surprising that all these connections died and probably needed to remain hidden, to be honest, because the knowledge was for peaceful purposes only. Alchemy was the missing link. The secret techniques of how to access the knowledge did not entirely die out after Egypt collapsed, went up the trade routes, notably to the northern Euphrates to Haran, where it's kept alive by alchemists and Sabians. And we did slowly reconnect through the Knights Templars, through the Renaissance, but I have to leave that to another day. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.